Look, I don't want to be rude, but uh, I'm not much of a conversationalist. Well, please don't let me stand in your way. The last thing I want to be remembered as is an annoying blabbermouth. <laughs> you know, nothing grinds my gears worse than some chowder head who doesn't know when to keep his big trap shut. I always like to find people who have qualities in their own character that are similar to the qualities in the written character. Usually what happens uh, is I'll write it, and then I'll um, cast the film. And then I usually go back and adjust things for a particular actor's style. If you look at Macaulay Culkin, if you look at John Candy, you look at Molly, it's not that just he fit them into what he wrote. He had an idea for the character. He, it was written. He'd give the actor that script. But then there was something else that happened. Then there was this kind of a tailoring and a customizing and a sense of, I'm going to make this fit like a glove. He got to know his actors as who they were. He'd want to talk about everything under the sun with you, and that's how he, many times, I would watch him get more of an understanding of your humanity, your eccentricities, what makes you happy, what you're afraid of, and he would write from that, as opposed to, I wrote a character, and you're a good actor, so here you go. It wasn't like that. So for him, I think just having the actor brought the character to life. And the actor was thrilled, because it allowed them to not just act, but to be that character, to own it and to channel it. That's what he was after. And he got lucky in that he found Molly Ringwald, who was an actress who totally got him and who he totally got. I don't see what makes you so different. I have some taste. He had a bunch of young people come in and audition for this thing he was going to do called The Breakfast Club. And then the, the story is that during that process, he met Molly Ringwald. And, and he was so taken with this girl, this fascinating young girl, that. He went away and he wrote 16 Candles in a Weekend, is the, is the legend. You know, in a sense, she was his muse. I mean, if you look at Scorsese and De Niro, they were a pair. They complement one another. And I think for John, Molly was able to be that person. I think John respected her for her feeling about the characters. He worshipped what she could bring to the screen. Uh, and respected it tremendously. She left us, Daddy. We didn't leave her. There was nothing we could do about it. It just happened. And I envy that to a certain extent. Since when's a daughter supposed to know more than a father? <laughs> Same thing with Anthony Michael Hall. Clearly, they got each other on a level that doesn't always happen with directors and actors. But obviously, he, he would find the muse, because after Molly, he found John Candy and then wrote for him. You're going the wrong way! Thank you! <laughs> You're going in the wrong direction! <laughs> I just started grinding these scripts out, and then I saw them on the screen, and I thought, well, that isn't exactly what I had in mind. The reason I wrote Breakfast Club was because I wanted to do something that was very small. But, you know, I figured if, if it didn't cost anything, they'd let me direct it. So I said, well, I'll make a movie in one room. And we'll only have to build one room, and we'll never have to leave, and we can eat there and everything. And then I wrote 16 Candles and said, uh, no, I have to direct this one. I think it's very flat. Okay. He's the one that's getting freaked out now. You should say excuse me, which will be his cue to go. Okay. I got into it through. I was naive, you know. When I, when I did 16 Candles, I didn't know anything about how movies were done. And, you know, I mean, I thought I had to make lunch for everybody. I just didn't know. Um, so when it came down to the wardrobe, I thought I would have to pick all the wardrobe um, and casting. I thought I'd have to pick all the cast. And I like to do that. On a set, I know from others that he was, you know, he was in charge. But I also understand that he was not a martinet. He was, uh, he was well received by the actors. He's a really sweet guy, but you were always aware that he had a lot of power and that he really cared about your respect for his characters. There were a few times when John was under pressure that he got tense and I'm like, what's with John today, you know? But we're human beings, you know, we're not machines. You know, the few times when any of us didn't agree with something, it could be quite tense. He wanted things a certain way, and uh, and he was he would battle for them. But it never lasted, you know? You never had the feeling that any any anything that happened at work, it never carried over to the next day or, or anything like that. I remember one day he came up to me, and he took my purse, my, my set purse, and opened it up. I wanted to make sure it wasn't stuffed with 
Kleenex that I had actually thought about what Amanda Jones would have in her purse. And I was, whew, I had thought of that. So I passed that test. You know, I like, you know, give, give people a lot of freedom. And there are certain people who would prefer to be told, what are my lines? Where do you want me to stand? How do you want me to do it? And I'm, if that's what makes them comfortable and help them deliver their performance, then that's what I'll say. I, mean, I think that's the important thing is what do you need to uh, deliver your performance and, and the job of director is to, as I see it, is to help them get there. He never coddled anyone. He wasn't warm like that warm. He was warm as John getting the character that he wrote out of you. And he would talk for hours if he had to, to an actor, to express certain things. He was sometimes very specific, you know, when he wanted you to turn your head. I mean, very detailed. No. And then other times he was very loose. And we just, we improvised, my memory is. I think he was so confident in what he was able to do that once he would hear it aloud, he would say, okay, okay, do it. Okay, try something different. Just, okay, make something up. You know, and he did that with all of us. Well, I'll see you tomorrow then. Gobble, gobble. <laughs> he desired change in the writing, and I was trying not to change as much as he wanted to change, because I believed in his writing, and he was so available to the actors to make changes. He loves collaborating with his actors and to get you going, and he makes you feel so comfortable, and he gets very excited when you get excited. He'll let you incorporate what you feel to be right into the dialogue, and, and, and he's very improvisational and very collaborative. I mean, he really says the right things at the right time, and he works in a way that is uh, really unique and yet uh, incredibly rewarding. He takes input from anywhere he sees it, and so he doesn't have a real big ego about this is my picture. He's smart enough to take everything and simulate it and use what he thinks is right and what isn't. He let's go of. You know, I didn't have to come in and say, now do it as written. You know, I never, I mean, it's just not. No, he doesn't work that way at all. He, he's really looking for what's best, as we all are. And it's, that's a great, it's the best kind of collaboration. No one's fighting. Every take was a little bit different, you know? Yeah. There's no point in doing the same take over and over and over. Um, and before we started anything, we all had a little conference about whether or not we could make the scene, I'm gonna stage it better, is there better dialogue, and please help me fix this dreadful script, oh, time on. be modest, oh, it's a I'm great script. A lot of that stuff was probably just for John's own amusement. He was just, you know, we got it, just, you know, make me laugh, you know. Somebody's got an idea. I don't care where an idea comes from. If I, if I think of it or whoever, I mean, my, my sound man, Jim Alexander's always come up to me with suggestions, dialogue things, and a couple of his lines were in Breakfast Club. And I welcome that. I don't, you know, I mean, pride of authorship is something that I'm not really burdened with. I don't care where it comes from. I mean, it's, it's what, what is the picture ultimately going to look like? I mean, if set dressing has a wardrobe idea, I would hope that they give the wardrobe people that idea, and the wardrobe should feel comfortable saying yes or no to it. Hi, I'm looking for that song about the guy that killed himself for the girl that hated his guts. Do you know what song I'm talking about? I sort of, in a way, got into the movies to get into music. And here I am. Applause, applause, applause. My uh, personal tastes are uh, more rock and roll based. And one of the reasons I like doing young film so much is that I really get to get in there with the music and get it loud. John was definitely a music nerd uh, and absolutely proud of it and had a, just an encyclopedic knowledge of mostly British music because that's what he was an enormous fan of at the time. Obviously he was a huge Psychedelic Furs fan. I mean I, the reason he wrote the movie was because of the Psych Furs song and then wrote it for Molly. He needed music. It was just like, you know, literally like, you know, staying alive. It, I think, was part of his process. It helped ignite him. I can't really get a full sense of the film until I know what the music is going to be. There's a rhythm to the writing that's dictated by whatever I'm going to be listening to. They just don't write love songs like they used to. It's, I, I, oh. Before I start a script, I usually have a selection. I have 90-minute cassette that I ride around in the car with that is how I want the music to sound. He'd call you from the car uh, with this music, and he'd talk softly, and music would be loud, and you'd be like, 
You could either choose to listen to the music or you could try to hear John. I'll go through my records and pick out what sound, uh, what, what kind of music, what kind of bands I want for the particular film. And I'll play that endlessly while I'm writing the thing. So, I mean, it's music is really tied in from the beginning. You know, I mean, Simple Minds, I liked the stance that their music took. There was a certain tone to their music that I thought matched the tone of The Breakfast Club. The, the band as a whole, so you can say, um, Simple Minds is doing the title song. People who knew Simple Minds uh, would have a sense of what the film is going to be, because that those their politics and the politics of the film were in sync. Yes. Can I get your opinion on something here? Is this any good? It's hot. White hot. He also relished uh, discovering groups or exposing them uh, to the world. By the time I heard it, it was always, look, listen to what I found, and he would play it for me. I think he felt a little bit like a music nerd with unlimited power. <laughs> because all of a sudden, uh, uh, he he uh, he changed from a guy who just you know loved these bands from afar, and he became a guy who could make bands and break bands in the United States. And I think that uh, was a huge uh, area of satisfaction for him. I don't think that many people were aware of New Order until we used a bunch of their stuff in Pretty in Pink. One day I came back, I showed him a sequence that Richie Marks, my editor, had cut. We came to his office, little office in the back of his house. He was writing, and he just threw on this New Order track. We looked at it and went, oh my god. You know, it was just this magical sense that it was a score, but it wasn't score, it was source that acted as score. And that added a lot to the simplicity and the everyday life of these characters. At that time in history, you know, in the 80s, that was something that felt innovative. It had been done before, but it felt like it captured the sensibility. It captured the times a little bit, and it worked. He even founded his own record label, uh, you know, uh, 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 which their first release, I believe, was Flesh for Lulu, which I still have, <laughs> which is actually a great album. The label was really designed to first to handle uh, the soundtracks so that we could, you know, again, it's, it's adding a little bit more control to the film so that, uh, you know, we, we'll, we can pick the single. You know, the, the, uh, we'll have greater control in who's going to be on the album. OMD was really amazing because I remember we met with OMD. John talked about the scene, how we talked about the scene. And the next day, or two days later, they gave us the track, which was really incredible. It was hard for him, actually, to deal with that, that the label, that his record label, did not end up, you know, uh, um, being his main focus in some respects, because I know how excited he was about that. Do you think I'm going to be happy? I mean, honestly. Yeah, you'll be happy. <laughs> you just won't know it, that's all. I'm not through yet. I still got a lot of stories. And I still have a lot of enthusiasm for it, as much uh, as ever. And I've got a couple more projects that are already started. Um, you know, every February, it seems, this is the third February in a row I've had a picture out. So no, I'm not gonna, it's not the end. And uh, when people stop going, I guess it'll, it'll be time to stop. But um, so far, they're still going. So I'm not, uh, and, I, and I, my, my enthusiasm for it, for the, that period of life is still strong and, and you know when they when that audience boos me I'll bow out but uh, I like it and I, I want to continue with it. Success has an impact on everybody and, and it didn't have the best impact on him. His gift as a writer was his heart and I think that same heart got broken here. I think the combination of, of power and talent I think can be very hard on people when you're sensitive. I think John um, took things very personally uh, in the movie business and if you're in the movie business for a long time you realize it's not personal it's just a stupid business <laughs> you know and if you can love the stupidity and say you know what it's entertaining um, you can you know have a career that spans decades in this business and, and really enjoy yourself but John I think cared too deeply about what he was doing to let that stuff go. It's difficult to put a thick skin on when 
you want to be sensitive to the honesty of people's emotions. So I understand why it was hard for him. Well, you think what you want about me. I'm not changing. I like, I like me. My wife likes me. My customers like me. Because I'm the real article. What you see is what you get. I don't think he, like, trusted a lot of people in a lot of ways, you know? Every time he felt a project get away from him, uh, every time that uh, he couldn't do a project because the studio just wasn't making that kind of movie at the time, any, any time another director didn't do a script the justice that he had hoped, um, I think a little part of him died. He knew, even though he was one of the bigger pieces of cheese out here, you're still gonna have to answer to somebody or somebody's still gonna say, I want you to change something. I think he just found the system frustrating. You know, having come out of a magazine where uh, no one ever edited my work, you know, I mean, we, we, we had a tremendous amount of freedom, uh, the writers of the Lampoon, to suddenly be sitting in a conference room with 30 people saying, I, I don't know, you know, maybe he, maybe he shouldn't get in the car there, maybe he should get in a helicopter. I mean, no, he's, you know, and, and I knew how the thing worked, and I created the characters and I thought all this stuff. I knew, I knew the internal workings of these things. And I just don't think you can write by committee. I just never, never saw, I never saw a group of people go into a room and uh, paint a picture or write a book. I just, you know, I just don't think you can do that. It obviously makes me sad because he's no longer with us, but it also makes me sad because I saw John change and I saw the business take a toll on him. He wasn't really into directing again. He didn't feel it. I don't know why. I actually know a couple things that led to it. I know there was a project that was very frustrating for him that he couldn't get off the ground. I just think at, at some point, he didn't want to answer to anybody. He needed to, uh, from my point of view, uh, do other things that excited him. I commend him for returning back to his roots and going back to Chicago and just saying, I'm not doing this. I, I see what it's doing to me and I'm not doing it. As much money as he might have had, as much uh, material things, it just didn't matter because nobody was close. You didn't have that camaraderie that he came from. I gradually really totally lost touch with him, to tell you the truth. But I think a lot of people did. Apparently, he bought a big piece of land uh, and uh, and actually apparently tried to farm it, <laughs> which uh, that's, that was a rumor. I don't know if it's true. He got this property, huge property, acres and acres outside of Chicago in the countryside somewhere. I forgot exactly where. And uh, he was raising like 18th century cattle. He had made an amazing farm and planted so many amazing trees. He, he was very excited about uh, uh, Botany. You know what? That's kind of a nice vision of, uh, of uh, John Hughes. I, I, that's the way I'd like to re uh, remember him, um, with wearing his overalls. You know, I would imagine he'd at least have the Walkman with the, you know, uh, with the psychedelic furs on. You know, it's possible to think of him in exile or something like that, but I don't think so. I think he was, uh, it sounded like he had a very full uh, life that he was really loving. I still love to write. I haven't lost any. In fact, uh, when I finish directing a picture, I can't wait to start writing again. I just like to do it. It's, you know, some people put ships in bottles. I put scripts in bottles. It almost rhymed. Did you ever expect him to come back and do something else? Yeah, I did. I expected it. I mean, I know he turned away, but I expected something. I expected a book or a very personal movie. I mean, yeah, I did. I expected it. I was hopeful. It's amazing to me that at a certain point he stopped because I don't know what he did with all that talent. I don't know how many scripts he wrote and stuck in a drawer. He wrote forever. He wrote diaries and he wrote uh, 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 books. He needed to tell these stories. He needed to write. He had lots of scripts. He told me, I said, give me one of them. You know, and he said, no, I don't know. I don't want to deal with those people in Hollywood. I said, I'll deal with the people in Hollywood. But I don't think he ran away. I think he left and went back home. Maybe he knew he was gonna go early. You know, sometimes that happens. Maybe he knew he wanted to spend the rest of his time with his family, I don't know. Maybe he just felt like, um, I'd be happy just writing, staying in Chicago, just writing. Don't know, I don't know. Do you remember the last time you spoke with John? No, I don't. Um, 
I know we had a laugh, and I don't remember when it was, no. I, I don't ever be one of those guys that when you leave, they go, huh. Oh. So I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of that, and I don't get in people's way. I was in Williamstown, where my wife was doing a play, and I got a phone call from our attorney. Uh, John and I had to share the same attorney, and he called me in tears and told me. Oh my God, where was I? That was uh, so shocking. Befittingly, I was in Chicago. I heard it on the radio, and I stopped, and I, because I couldn't believe it. And I called somebody, and they said yes, and I started crying. I really started crying. When John died, it was like part of our, our lives left. His passing really uh, made me feel like a grown-up, um, uh, in a not a good way, <laughs> you know? It was a shock. It never occurred to me that that would happen. You know, I was just, I, I didn't believe it like the rest of the world didn't believe it. It sounds stupid, I know. It's just there's some people that I just don't think of as, um, I don't think that they're ever gonna die. Through his work, he'll be alive forever. But, you know, just the mere fact that that energy was not on the planet anymore, that was weird. I felt so sad that he, um, I don't know, I felt I felt bad that I, that I hadn't gotten to ask him, you know, talk to him more. And I felt really bad for all his friends and his, his wife who, you know, he worshiped. It was very hard to accept. It's still, still sinking in. But I miss him. Is there anything that we can learn from your films that is an insight into who you are? <laughs> uh, I work a lot, <laughs> stay up late, listen to a lot of records. Um, yeah, I, I guess you could. I mean, I, you know, I'd take more film than I think we could ever put together to, to break that all down, but yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I don't think I'm too much different than the, than the material that I deal with. Working with him will always be special to me. John reminds me of our youth in Hollywood when we were innocent and we believed anything was possible. I think John Hughes' legacy will be how deeply felt his movies are and how they still uh, resonate with the public. He must have got something right about about being a teenager. You know, when you catch a moment in people's lives really, really specifically and really perfectly, that's all you can hope for as an artist. And he did that over and over again. That's the gratifying part about it. You know it's good because the people, real people, um, embraced it. It wasn't just manufactured, it was personal. And I think this is why they've endured. I think this is why they're considered, you know, iconic. I wanted to see one more thing, you know? I wanted them to do one more great movie. I wanted to see it, you know? It's like he said, you know, in Ferris Bueller, life moves pretty fast. You don't stop and look around once in a while. You could miss it. And um, he was right. I mean, I'm not in a position to give anybody messages. What I hope that they come out of the films with, and I think in some cases have, is um, a, a fundamental belief in yourself and a certain amount of, 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 of self-reliance that don't bother with, with you know, what other people say about you. You know, proceed on the path that you think is, is right for yourself and you know, listen, to, listen to your own feelings and respect yourself. I mean, I think those are important general things that these pictures keep hitting at. The films don't set out to change anybody, but if, you know, if, if, if they can impact on someone in a positive way like that, uh, it's a little bonus. I wish John could do one. It would be, would make the, uh, make it a better documentary. We should hear from John.
He wouldn't have done it. He would have said no. Probably. You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go.